Okay, today we're going to take care of category cabling. Let's see how far we go. Sometimes uh, I'm able to uh, carry through the whole lesson and sometimes, uh, who knows, all right? Uh, hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll be able to finish this whole thing uh, in, uh, in an hour, all right? Hello. All right, so category cabling right off the spot, right off the bat. Um, no, 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 no. Can you spot any cabling faults here? I don't expect you to know right away, but uh, one thing I'm going to point out to you is that uh, these cables are tied with tiny zip ties, or maybe even looks like uh, one of those twisty thingies that uh, that you uh, tie plastic bags with. What is the problem with that? problem with that is that they put too much pressure on uh, very little area there and if you do that these forces are not distributed evenly um, across larger area so when you do that uh, you're squeezing the cable or you're deforming the cable in one spot that is not good for any kind of cabling this this looks like category cabling uh, and if I didn't say anything, uh, and if somebody showed me the picture, um, I wouldn't tell what kind of cable it is because I don't see the endings and I don't see anything else that has to do with that. If somebody told me these are cut, this is cut six cables, uh, these are cut six cables, I would believe. But uh, I'm the one who took that picture, <laughs> so I know what the cables, uh, what cables uh, they were. These are coaxial cables. But they look nice and colorful, colorful. So I just thought I would throw that in and let's pretend these are category cables. With the category cables, cut 5E, cut 6, cut 6A, cut 7, and so on, um, we are not supposed to use zip ties. You can use some lightly pressured zip ties with cut 5E because cut 5E will forgive you way more than cut 6. Uh, but uh, but then uh, some some companies uh, ban the uh, the zip ties with their cables completely just to make sure just to be on the safe side. Now, if somebody's experienced, they they, they might want to use the zip ties, you know, but they have to be used lightly in order to not deform the cables. The cables cut cut five E and up. Those cables do not like any deformations any dents any kinks or anything like that because um, if you deform this cable in any way if you compromise the structure of it um, you are basically compromising the specifications of that of those cables what are we supposed to use we're supposed to use velcro there we go that's what Velcro looks like, and sometimes you buy those in the big bundles and carry it in your tool bag, and you use the Velcro to bind the bundles of the cables. What did I write here? Data cable bundles should be bound with Velcro tape, and the best thing would be if it's a soft side in. Right? Um, and these are different colors you can use. And over here, if you see the uh, PDF file which is available for you to download excuse me on our class portal uh, you will be able to see that this is not soft side in somebody right here you can just tell right here that this is the uh, the velcro part the, those little catchy thingies I'm not even sure what to call them they are touching the cables not that much of a big deal how Ever the soft side should be in, right? All right, let's start with this. This let's let's say this is a conductor, just a single conductor. Right? Just pay attention to this, and uh, you will see what uh, where I'm going with this. Right? If you make the conductor conduct electricity, and let's say the current flows from this side to that side now there are two types of current flows there's a conventional current flow and there's something that's called an electron flow according to the conventional current flow the current flows from the positive side of whatever supplies the power which would be called a power supply towards the negative 
So from the plus to minus, that's how the current flows and that's how you are uh, indicating the current with the arrows. Now, that was before they, okay? Who is they? Who are they? It's them. Okay? Before they found out that actually it's not the pluses that flow, it's actually the electrons that flow uh, through the cables or through the conductors, then uh, something, something that, that's called electron flow was established because really what is happening is the electrons, which are negatively charged, they are flowing from the negative uh, terminal of the power supply towards the positive part of the power supply. So that is called an electron flow. And you are, when you when you can when you're considering the electron flow to calculate your circuits, you are going to indicate the current flow uh, uh, with an arrow according to from minus to plus. Or if you use conventional current flow from plus to minus, what is the difference? Well, there's not much of a difference, uh, except uh, that uh, uh, it is a good idea when you're calculating the whole circuit. It's to do the calculations from the beginning to the end and stick to whatever convention you pick. If you pick the conventional current flow, stick with it from the beginning to the end. If you pick the electron flow, Stick from stick with it with all your calculations from the beginning to the end. Now, electron electron flow or conventional current flow, there is a little bit of a difference in interpreting uh, something that's called electromotive force. For example, uh, in you know, in one side in, in in when it comes to electrical machines, so uh, you're going to use right hand rule or a left hand rule depending on which convention you use do i remember all the uh, all the right hand rules and left hand rules no i don't whenever i am supposed to uh, find out uh, which way the uh, the uh, the motor will turn or which way the force is going to be applied i'm just going to go and either google it or look at my notes and uh, and that's all so uh, yeah okay but let's not get off the topic let's say that there is a current flowing through this conductor. What is going to happen when the current flows? When the current flows, it's going to cause an electromagnetic field or sometimes magnetic field. Well, it's electric field and magnetic field. And uh, we're just going to talk about the magnetic field or you can say electromagnetic field. And uh, uh, the way it is going to go is just like on this picture. Uh, it just is going to circle around the conductor. Right. So the current flow causes an electromagnetic field around the conductor. Which way does it flow? Well, if you imagine the corkscrew, um, if you maybe have uh, you know some glass of wine for your dinner, or with your dinner or something like that, that's how the corkscrew works. So when you are okay, this is this looks like it's on my left hand side, but this is actually my right hand side. But so so if you are turning the uh, uh, the corkscrew this way it is going to move it is going to move that way right so that's the same way right here uh, when the conventional current flow is applied this would be the direction of the of the magnetic field right? all right so let's get rid of the corkscrew here now and we're going to put in another conductor beside it and let's say the conductor that is, well, I'm not sure if you could see, it's a burgundy red kind of a thing, color. The darker one, and here's the blue one, okay, on top. Let's say the bottom uh, conductor is an active one, so that means that there is a power supply connected to it, and the current flows through this conductor, and maybe there is some sort of a load, and through that load, the current is going to flow back to the power supply again. So this would be the active current, uh, active conductor. If you align another conductor right beside it, that conductor is going to find itself within the magnetic field produced by the first conductor. So the first conductor has caused the magnetic field to occur. But when we place another conductor within that magnetic field that was produced by the other conductor, that magnetic field is going to cause a current flow in the conductor that is not active, that is not connected anywhere. Or it could be connected to a load. 
So um, uh, that's basically how the transformers work, except with the transformers, you put a lot of windings. So you increase the length of the conductor uh, on one side and you increase the length of the conductor by, by, making, by producing windings. And uh, one winding is going to affect the other winding by having a current flow through it. Right? So that's uh, if it's a transformer then it's something that works for us. Can this thing work against us? Well, yes, it can. Right? Um, so here is the arrow. Here are the arrows of the current flow. Right. Now, what is going to happen is if we have two communications cables, let's say it's a telephone cable. And if we put one cable in a straight line beside another cable in a straight line, and if those two cables have conductors that don't have any twist in them, they're just straight conductors, as an example of that, it would be a Z type of wire, Z cable, right? Z cable, it would be Z4, Z8, and whatnot. So Z4 would be a cable that has uh, four straight conductors inside. And usually it will be red, green, black, and yellow, right? Um, now Z8 would be having eight conductors in it and so on, but these are straight untwisted conductors within that cable, okay? So, um, uh, so what happens if we have two cables like that, that are, that they don't, that the cables don't have twisted pairs in them, the conductors are going to be straight, all right? And a straight cable, straight conductor is going to have a nice and steady, nice quote unquote, nice and steady electromagnetic field around it, which is going to have enough area in common to affect the other conductor. So if there's a telephone conversation on one pair, which is straight untwisted pair, and if you put another telephone conversation cable right beside the first one, there is a possibility of a signal bleeding from one cable to another. And that is called, that is called a crosstalk. Right? Basically, it's a ble signal bleeding from one pair to another. And in this case, it doesn't work for us. This kind of phenomenon works against us. Right? Because if you want to have a conversation with someone on the phone, you want to have a nice clean conversation, without somebody cutting in or hearing some noises or interference or maybe hearing some other conversation. Uh, the crosstalk was very popular in the good glorious POTS type of days when uh, POTS lines were very popular. POTS lines are still popular, not as much as they used to. We have way more um, twisted pair uh, category cabling being used, coaxial cables as well right now, more and more popular what's becoming more and more popular is the optical fiber or fiber optics okay so uh, let's see what i uh, what i wrote here if i can remember if i don't i'm just going to try to read it crosstalk in electronics crosstalk is an, is any phenomenon by which a signal transmitted from one circuit or channel of a transmission system creates an undesired effect in another circuit or channel so it's not a good thing that is happening. Crosstalk is usually caused by undesired capacitive and inductive or conductive coupling from one circuit onto uh, or channel to another. In this uh, in this case, when we talk when we have two ca uh, two cables beside each other, that cable is going to induce the electricity flow from one cable to another. So this crosstalk is happening by induction. Uh, in structured cabling, structured cabling, what's a structured cabling? Well, it's the uh, cables that connect their computers to whatever they are connected to. Which be, which will, usually it would be in a LAN room to some sort of a switch or patch panel first. In structured cabling, electromagnetic interference from one pair to another. So when we're talking about crosstalk in the subject area that we're talking about, we're talking about um, electromagnetic interference from one pair to another. 
So crosstalk, what's the difference between crosstalk and interference? You might ask. All right. I'm going to answer. Um, crosstalk would be one signal leading to another pair. So it would be crosstalk. Interference would be if the cables, for example, they run through, uh, through the ceiling space and if they are too close to some sort of machinery that produces basically noise. Um, what would be the noisy machines? Well, HVAC systems, heat pumps, they, uh, they, they have some moving parts, there's uh, some electric motors running in them. Uh, they cause electromagnetic interference which could bleed through into the, into the cable. So uh, when you're running uh, uh, Ethernet cables, you need to avoid anything that is electronic. Sometimes it's not easy to do because sometimes the ceiling space is quite packed. Right? But avoid, avoid uh, running cables close to some equipment that is producing some sort of, um, you know, usually some electric motors or so. Yeah. Uh, also, what are really bad, bad um, uh, occurrences for the um, uh, for the uh, for the interference would be um, alarm cables. Right? Fire alarm or security alarm cables. Those cables are so noisy that you should avoid them at any cost, at all cost. Right? Not really at all cost, but avoid them. Usually one foot apart from that, uh, from any other cabling, is a really good idea because you don't know what's going through this. Uh, if you, if you sometimes when you're going to work in this field and you have something that's called a toner, um, which would be like a probe that senses any kind of uh, signal, right? So you put it through that through the cable, uh, let's say a security alarm cable. And you're going to hear a whole bunch of noise through that. Uh, it sounds like eh, 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 just like that. All right? I'm not repeating that. <laughs> all right. Um, so uh, thermostat cables are also really bad for interference. So those ca those equipment that runs that does something uh, they can produce interference. Uh, but if you have too many cables together in close proximity and if they don't use twisted pair or any kind of a shielding metal shielding because if you wrap a conductor in a, any kind of a metallic object which could be a tin foil right or a braided shield uh, then the metal it causes something that's called like a Faraday's cage effect it's basically keeping the electromagnetic field within so if you don't have twisted pair or shielding, then uh, there's a chance that the crosstalk or interference might happen into data cables. And <clears throat> when it comes to telephone cables, the POTS lines, these are analog lines. If you have crosstalk or interference within those type of cables, it might, um, it might be annoying to you. Uh, you could hear some noises and buzzing and whatnot, and it could be irritating. Uh, but if it's uh, if it's Ethernet cables which carry data signal, digital signal, uh, there's no talking about being annoyed. Basically, the whole signal just disappears because uh, we're having ones and zeros. And if ones and zeros from one cable are mixed in with ones and zeros pulses with another cable, the equipment uh, on the receiving end doesn't know what type of a language that cable is talking because there could be too many ones and zeros happening, too many pulses. Okay, so um, so that's uh, that's uh, uh, that's about that. About when it comes to this, let me just zoom out a little bit so I can switch the screens. All right, so here's the. Uh, here is the picturization of a crosstalk. Let's say on one side you have another, you have a wonderful conversation that's happening between two wonderful people, and on the other cable there's another conversation that is happening between two other wonderful people. All right, and if the cables are straight, not twisted pairs. Um, then, uh, then the crosstalk might happen, and they could uh, hear each other's uh, conversations through the cable. Okay. 
Uh, now, I talked to you about the shielding, so um, uh, uh, we just mentioned that uh, one way to, pre uh, to prevent crosstalk or, or interference would be shielding the pairs. So that's one way. The other way is twisting the pair, right? and we'll, we'll, go off, we'll go over that as well. All right, the crosstalk, digital crosstalk, crosstalk problems, unshielded, twisted pair. Uh, this is a very short three-minute video that you, um, I'm going to encourage you to watch on your own. Uh, it is an extreme situation because, um, uh, well, this person demonstrates two video signals happening on two different uh, cables, and when you bring them together, the video signal just disappears because it's a digital signal. Now, it's an extreme case because uh, quite often you're going to, uh, when you're going to run wires, install a network cabling, which this course is about, you're going to have bundles of cables. And so, so how come? Back show me the video here. And, uh, you know, so uh, uh, it's not as bad, but, uh, but, uh, but this person is demonstrating an extreme case of, uh, of a crosstalk. And what happens in a digital circuit? In a digital circuit, the crosstalk will cause a signal failure. Right. Why is it going to cause a signal failure? Well, if, uh, if you have an analog signal, you have a bunch of waves happening there, and the waves can get mixed in with another wave, so um, you're going to hear a little bit of a different signal uh, that is unwanted, but you still be able to carry the conversation, or you'll be able to watch the video signal. It's just going to some other picture is going to cut through. So that's just annoying, right? When it comes to digital, digital, the trans digital transmission happens that you have a bunch of ones and zeros, it's pulses, and they travel through that cable or pair or conductor. And uh, on the receiving end, that uh, that whatever is equipment receives that is that equipment is going to look for specific pulses timed in a specific way in order to interpret that as a valid signal. Now, if those ones and zeros that are supposed to be timed a certain way, if they got mixed in with some other overlay of, of, uh, of pulses or digital signals, ones and zeros, then the timing is going to be completely off. You're going to have too many ones and zeros, and the equipment is just not going to understand that signal. And when that happens, the digital circuitry just shuts down. Um, all right. Now let's take a look at something that's called a UTP. Uh, you might hear that quite often, and that stands for unshielded twisted pair. Now this is a CAT six category six cable, and uh, I'll tell you why. How can you tell that it's at least category six? Okay, it could be CAT seven, but it looks like CAT six to me. Uh, what happens is that you have pairs being twisted. <laughs> All right. The pairs are being twisted. What happens? What happens when you twist a pair? Well, remember when you have a signal going through a straight wire, it's going to cause a steady electromagnetic field around it, which can affect another cable that is brought beside it. Right. So now, when you twist the pair, that pair, the twisted pair, yes, it is still going to have some electromagnetic field around it, but just take a look, just think about it, when you twist that pair, that electromagnetic field is not going to be as steady, it's going to be dispersed in different directions a little bit, so it's not going to be as strong, so it's not as constant, so it doesn't, it's not going to have that radiating power as much as if would be used with a straight wire. Now, when you put another twisted pair beside it, then that twist, that twist might not align with the other twist. Chances are that it won't align if it's the same rate of twist. So the electromagnetic field is going to have a hard time inducing the signal in the other, uh, in the other uh, pair. But what happens is that if you notice, if you look at this picture, you're going to notice that these pairs are also twisted at different rate. So, for the purpose to uh, for the, for for the purpose of the electromagnetic field to have even harder time trying to induce itself onto the other pair. Right? 
so <clears throat> uh cat category five uh, cat 5e which is the minimum right requirement right now for digital equipment uh, it will have a bunch of twist or oh, a bunch of twi four twisted pairs inside the cable and they're going to be twisted at different rate in order for the signal to not bleed through another uh, from one pair to another well if the signal is strong enough uh, yes you're going to have some possibility but the possibility is much less so that's why we use twisted pair okay. Uh, now, CAT6 is not only going to have um, twisted pairs, and the twist is going to be much tighter, but it also is going to have a separator inside. It's a plastic separator. It's just like, like a kind of a crisscross thing. And each pair lies in its own groove, and that separator also has a steady twist in it. So the pairs are not only twisted around each other's conductors, but the pairs are also twisted around each other as well at a, at, a, at a rate in order to it's all about trying to prevent the crosstalk okay. all right so this is utp unshielded twisted pair and these are the cables that we are playing uh, with uh, in our labs and when you did the two less or 110 punch down jack when we did the Ethernet uh, jacks, uh, the plugs, uh, there's all those RJ45 connectors uh, for the Ethernet cables. These are the cables that we're playing with, right? Except uh, we are using CAT5E, and uh, that CAT5E will not have that plastic separator. CAT6 and up, you're going to see that separator in there, right? So UTP, the purpose of a twist is to eliminate the crosstalk between the pairs. And here's a very good example. You can see that you can see that the green pair is twisted at a different rate than the brown pair right here. There we go. Now um when we talked about unshielded twisted pair or utp we can also talk about something that's called a shielded twisted pair so the pairs not in order to prevent it's all about preventing the crosstalk or or interference one way or the other which means from the cable onto another cables or from other cables or equipment into this cable that carries the signal uh, sometimes the interference is so bad, and that usually happens in industrial environments. So you're going to see a lot of those cables or Ethernet cables that are run in an industrial environment, when there's a lot of machinery and so and whatnot. Uh, you're going to see a lot of twisted pair in order to eliminate the interference from running electric motors and relays opening and closes, closing and all that stuff. All that stuff. All right. So. So, STP stands for shielded twisted pair. So the pairs are not only twisted, uh, they're also shielded with aluminum foil, tin foil. Right, so what do they write here? Although UTP cable is the least expensive cable, because of course you're going to have to spend more money in order to produce a cable that is shielded. It might be, uh, okay, although UTP is the least expensive cables, it, cable, it might be susceptible to radio and electrical frequency interference. It should not be too close to electric motors, fluorescent lights, and other electric equipment or electronic equipment that can produce noise. Shielded twisted pair is available in three different configurations. Number one. Each pair of wires is individually. Uh, each pair of wires is individual, individually shielded with the foil, just like in this picture right here. Each pair is individually shielded with the with the foil, and then you have something that's called a ground wire or drain wire, right? grounding wire. That you can that basically makes physical contact with the foil, and foil is metal, and that thing is metal, so basically it has a connection to that, 
to those shields and that that uh, drain wire can be connected to some other um, one of the terminals of the conduct conductor one or the other when you have a twisted shielded pair you should those those cables should be grounded the ground wire should be grounded or bonded right <clears throat> uh, because if it's not then it's pretty much sometimes even worse than not having uh, the shield right because the the noise stays within it's just it just creates a mess right? so there's a one one scenario three uh, each pair of wires is individually shielded with a foil then it should be number two right? there is a foil or a braid shield inside the jacket covering all the wires as a group so instead of each pair being having an individual shield those pairs could be just running together, just like with the unshielded twisted pair, but there will be a, a, one common shield inside the jacketing of the cable, shielding all of them together at once. Or sometimes if you really, really want to eliminate the interference or any possibility of interference, or if you have a strong interference environment, then uh, you are going to pull all the guns, all the big guns, uh, roll them out and uh, uh, basically uh, try to prevent the interference. So sometimes there is a shield around in, it's like both, all right? I'm not gonna read that. Sometimes there is all individual shields around the pairs. And then on top of that, there's gonna be one common shield as well. Where do we use those cables? As I said, uh, the most common area is um, at, around uh, uh, electrical machines, PLCs and whatnot. Yes, sometimes you're going to see those machines um, uh, being connected, the controls for those machines being connected with unshielded twisted pair. It is possible because you know if the interference is low, but uh, but when somebody is when the engineers are designing a system that is involved that involves maybe 600 wires or cables, uh, then uh, you don't want to run 600 cables around all the machinery just to find out that oh no, there's interference. So you know what? We have to pull those out and get another. So quite often in the industrial environment, you're going to see STP, which would be uh, shielded twisted pair right. now there's one uh, slide before I get to the next one and uh, I'm going to show you what CCA means All right copper is expensive so somebody got the idea of uh, because copper is the better conductor than aluminum okay? but um, Copper is expensive. So somebody got the idea of running aluminum wires and just coating them on the outside with copper. And that is supposed to give you the same effect as having a whole copper, pure copper wire. Well, it kind of works, but it doesn't always work. So sometimes you're going to see um, it's a, it's a box of cable that is the same cable, same specifications, and one of them is going to say CCA, which says copper clad aluminum, which means there is aluminum conductors and they are coated or cladded with copper. And those that the box, a thousand foot box of that cable, is going to be significantly less expensive than a cable that is pure copper. Uh, my personal take on that is, even though that cable is cheaper or less expensive, I am trying to stay away from that in any of the jobs that I'm doing, because sometimes, even though it's supposed to work the same way, for some mysterious reasons, it just causes some problems. So I just stay away from the CCA. But I want you to know what CCA is. And you, now you know why you will know why some of the boxes of cables are going to be less expensive than the other ones. 
Well, there's a trade-off. There's a reason why they are less expensive, because all oh, aluminum is less expensive than copper. But also, there is sometimes the price to pay in having some aggravations in signal transfer, when it comes to signal transfer. All right, so that's, you know, what the CCA is. Now, here is the table that you might want to, want to well, I'm pretty sure you have downloaded the lecture notes right now. But this is a table that you're gonna, you might want to keep it in a safe place. Yes, you can Google the specifications um, of each in, an individual cable, and uh, and based on that, you can you can find out what the specs are. But you know what? Somebody did it for you. I I googled them all, and I put all the specs together in one table, so just for your convenience. And we're going to compare some of the specifications here. Now, uh, here. On the, in the first column, I categorized those cables, CAT5, CAT5E, CAT6, CAT6A, CAT7, CAT7A, up to CAT8. Uh, if you want to use CAT8, you might as well consider optical fibers right? uh, for the price and for the functionality of it. Right? So let's look at CAT5, Category 5. Okay? Category 5 has conductors that are... The, the, the gauge or the thickness of those single conductors inside those pairs are 24 gauge, 24 American wiring gauge. So they are pretty thin. Now, it does have a twist. The, the pairs are twisted. And next thing here, we're going to look at the transfer speed. And we're going to skip the max length for now. And the bandwidth. All right, transfer speed and the bandwidth. The transfer speed is going to tell you how many bits per second you're going to be able to transfer through that cable, or through one pair of that cable. And just as a reminder, when we are talking about speed of a signal, we are talking about bits per second. When we are talking about storage, like on your hard drive, you're not talking bits, you're talking bytes. And there is no per second, because storage is a storage. You can store information for many seconds. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but speed, we're talking bits. And storage, we're talking bytes. A bit is one single electrical pulse, digital pulse. That's a bit. A byte is eight of them. So... Here is the CAT5 is able to transfer 100 megabits per second, megabits per second, MBS. And the bandwidth of that is 100 megahertz. So it can transfer uh, 100 millions of the bits per second and it can carry a signal up to well sort of like a guaranteed uh, it can carry the signal up to 100 well, megahertz what does the what does the bandwidth what does bandwidth mean it means you can you can have a signal as high as 100 megahertz which is the vibrations per second Uh, vibrations it would be the cycles per second and the signal can be carried through that cable in a shape that is good enough for whatever is receiving that it's good enough for it to actually see the signal as something that is understandable and everything has a limit if you start carrying if you start transmitting signal that is faster than that in bandwidth as far as cycles per second like a radio wave right it's, if it's faster than the specifications then there's no guarantee that the signal is not going to trip over its own feet inside that cable right? applications well how you know, i just spent five minutes talking about cat5 and just to find out that applications obsolete not used anymore you can still use as pot lines or some control lines but um, 
you're going to have a hard time buying um, CAD 5 right now. The minimum right now requirement for pretty much all equipment right now is CAD 5E. E stands for enhanced. Now, let's look at CAD 5E. The conductor's gauge is also 24, but if you notice, it has a little tighter twist. Now, transfer speed, it can transfer one gigabit per second. And the bandwidth is, see, that's where the bandwidth changes here already. It can carry same as CAT5, which would be 100 megahertz, if it's the copper cladded aluminum cable. Or it can have a higher bandwidth, 350 megahertz, if it's BC, and BC stands for bare copper. The bandwidth has something to do with the analog form of signal, which would be like radio waves and so on. And as we remember, the internet to your home or to any facility from outside is delivered to you in an analog form. Radio waves carry that internet signal using frequency division multiplexing. And then they hit the modem, and the modem demodulates that signal, and it transfers it into a digital form of signal when you're having bits per second instead of hertz, right? Like a radio wave. So that's why we're talking about bandwidth as well. Uses for CAD 5E. Home, small offices, and commercial. It's probably the still could be the most popular cable that's being used. Although um, I see more and more often, uh, if there's any new installations, quite often um, CAT6 is requested. However, we're going to talk about why it makes no difference between CAT 5E and CAT 6 in certain cases, so why would you pay more? Because CAT 6 costs more, it's more expensive. In some cases, you might as well get CAT 5E because even though you have the CAT 6 cable, but if it is installed in a certain way, then you're going to get the CAT 5E specifications instead of CAT 6. You're not going to have um, the benefit for the dollar you're going to spend. Here is CAT 6. Oh, you can see that the cable, the conductors are much thicker right now. Well, much thicker. Instead of 24 gauge, it's 23 gauge. Right? Which, is, which means that the gauge goes down. Remember from last term? When the gauge goes down, the thickness goes up. So it's a thicker conductor that's being used in there. The twist is even tighter. And here's the transfer speed. Transfer speed has to do with the digital signal that carries the bits per second. And it can carry 1 gigabit or 10 gigabits per second, depending on the length. Right? And then again, here's the bandwidth, 250 or 500 megahertz, depending whether it's CCA or bare copper. Mostly commercial use, although some people use it in houses. Now, when you look at the maximum length, it's 300 feet. It's a magic number when it comes to installing data cables. It's actually 328 feet of a maximum length uh, for a Ethernet cable to carry a digital signal. If the signal, if the cable is longer, then the signal is going to trip over its own feet and you might have an unreliable link. Do not confuse that with unreliable transmission or reliable transmission. Reliable transmission is that the signal is being sent and is being received on the other end. It's going to be verified. It's going to be confirmed that the, the, the sender is going to get confirmation that the signal was received. So that's a reliable, reliable um, transmission. 
unreliable transmission is that the transmit there transmits and it just doesn't care if the receiver received it the receiver just receives there's no confirmation going back and forth sometimes unreliable uh, transmission is the better way to go because if you have something like a movie going through so a transmitter or a soccer game or football game every single bit is not going to be confirmed that would be just insane all right so uh it's just like broadcasting right? but uh, i'm talking about the reliability of a signal um, of a cable carrying the signal so look at that now the magic number is 300 feet even though it's really 328 feet if the ethernet cable is longer than 328 feet then you have not a reliable link the signal might be deteriorating to the point that you're going to have some loss losses in signal it's quite annoying or sometimes the transmission is going to fail so if it's way too long why is it 300 well firstly it's easier to remember now no link should be longer than 300 feet end to end so you'd be the uh, jack in the wall and the jack in the patch panel in the communications room why is it not 328 well as i said it's easier to remember but also think of that you're going to have some patch cables coming from that jack to whatever equipment and from this jack to whatever equipment and that gives you a little bit of a reserve on uh you know, a little bit of a headroom or playroom uh to um you know for that to to, uh, to to not exceed the maximum length so most of it is going to be 300 feet however when you look at the cat six here It is supposed to be able to carry one gigabit per second up to 300 feet. It has a little bit bigger bandwidth when it comes to carrying analog signal, but when you're installing the LAN configuration, you're going to have um, digital signal going on. So the bandwidth doesn't even come to play when it comes to that case. Now, it can carry up to 10 gigabits per second, so more information can be carried per time, so it's more efficient as far as information transfer or signal transfer, but it's only up to 180 feet. If it's longer than 180 feet, end-to-end, -end, all bets are off, you're falling down onto the CAT 5E specifications. So if somebody wants to have a network installed, and they want CAT6 because it's better than CAT5E. Of course, CAT6 is better than CAT5E and it's also more expensive. Well, it goes both ways. You know, it's more expensive, so it must be better, right? Well, uh, you're just going to, uh, if you're the one who is designing it or giving advice to the client, is that, well, first of all, check the distances because some buildings are bigger, some buildings are smaller, some of the routes that are being going in the ceiling, around the other, whatever and it all adds up it's end to end if it's longer than 180 feet from end to end then you just say why spend money on the cat 6 where you're not going to get that signal transfer at that rate because it's just way too long right? so uh, so that's why we're talking about here the distance right? now we're talking about cat 6a and a stands all for for enhanced but uh i forgot what the word was but it's just uh, somebody the, the synonymous words for it. so it, i forgot what it was but cat 6a is just a cat 6 enhanced the twist is even tighter the gauge is 23 and it's going to give you uh 10 gigabits per second up to 100 feet so if you really want so you either go less money spend less money and get cat 5e if it's more than 180 feet or you spend more money to get cut 6a if you really really want a faster speed on the on the cables and of course here's the bandwidth and it's mostly is commercial and here are you can use the same analogy by looking at the remaining of the table right all right cut for uh t560 how many slides do we have left 18 out of 24 you know what we just have nine minutes left and you still want to get probably to some other class 
and I don't want to rush through that because I want to I want to give you some proper uh, proper um, take on this. So we're going to stop right here, and uh, next time we see each other, we're going to look at the T568 uh, wiring details on the jacks and how the signal is being transferred uh, through the through the cables. We're just going to spend first couple minutes uh, on uh, argumented. There we go. Thank you, Carl. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that A stands for argumented, which basically means enhanced. <laughs> But thank you, thank you. I appreciate that. All right, so uh, we're going to finish uh, this lesson on uh, on uh, right here, and I'll see you next time. Um, we're going to talk about uh, also some different types of equipment that uh, that are being used: uh, security alarms, surveillance cameras, uh, fire alarms. Uh, we're going to take a look at some of the applications that uh, this. When it comes to the, well, this course is called network cabling. Um, it's not just running the wires from end to end and punching them on one side, punching them on the other side. Quite often, you're going to be installing the whole, whole systems. So uh, you're going to learn how certain school PA system works in order to be able to install that, configure it, and so on. You're going to learn how some certain security alarm works in order to, for it to you know, connect and figure out course you're going to run the wires make all the connections and all that stuff uh, very popular scenario is uh, would be the retail business when you're talking about a lot of POS's which is a point of sale which is basically a cash register uh, so the cash registers are computer equipment they have telephone equipment they have to be connected installed configured the equipment rack is going to have patch panel which all the wires come to then they're going to be cross connected uh, or patched through the switch and uh, that is going to be connected uh, to uh, the switch is going to you know connect, be connected to other equipment such as router or a modem or so on. So um, so quite often uh, you're going to install the whole systems, and uh, you know it's not. <laughs> Don't worry, like nobody's going to just throw a system at you and say, okay, today you're going to get something that you've never seen before and you're going to go and install it. Go do it now, right? Uh, that's not going to happen, right? Usually you're just going to start with helping somebody else who already knows that, who did through the same, uh, went through the same way that you. Uh, and then you're going to learn how to install that particular system. And then maybe you're going to have more contracts uh, or more work orders or more orders for that particular uh, uh, system one from one store to another there could be a different configuration mcdonald's or burger king they pretty much almost sell the same thing i shouldn't be saying that but uh, but uh, but the configuration uh, the data equipment configuration for one could be a little bit different than the other you know things like that right so we're going to take a look uh, things are uh, we're going to take a look at some of those things that you might expect that what you're going to run into and also in some further lectures we're going to uh, talk about um, maybe some possible equipment that uh, you should have if you want to go into this kind of business right and yes there is money in it there yeah enough for you to support yourself cool all right so you got uh, eight minutes to go and do whatever you need to go before your next class and i will see you next time thank you very much guys Yeah.